I'm ready for the live right now. Hi, everyone. All right, this is a very interesting experience since uh, I don't really know if you can all <laughs> hear me well or not, but I'm really hoping you can. So welcome everyone to our AdmaCamp online demo day, which we will kick off in just a little while. Um, since we're very punctual because we're based in Germany, I am gonna give people a few more minutes to, to join us or a few more seconds to join us. And in the meantime, I will, so before we jump into the actual interesting part of the demo day where the startups pitch, I will give you a brief uh, explanation. I will give you a brief explanation of what Enam is and what Adma Camp is all about, and also an idea of what is going to happen um, during these next couple of hours. Okay, so first of all, I'll show you the agenda of the day just to quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Antonia. Uh, for those of you that maybe are not familiar with Enum, I work for Enum, where I'm in charge of business development. And I'm here today with the rest of my team that I'll introduce in a moment. Um, and we've been organizing an advanced materials bootcamp, which we cleverly called Adma Camp, for the last week. And today is the final day of that program where the 13 participating startups will each give their pitches. So we're hoping many people will join this live stream to watch them. Usually we do these events uh, obviously live in, in Berlin um, for the reasons we all know, this is not possible at the moment. So hopefully we can manage to get some sort of interaction going um, in this new weird online format we have to work with. Um, so let me tell you what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be here. Uh, hopefully, you're all going to stay with us until about 5.30, maybe a little longer, as things sometimes tend to get a bit delayed, but we'll try to, to stick to this agenda. Um, and the goal really is to highlight these 13 very talented advanced material startups that we've identified that come from many different places, not just Germany, where we're based. Um, hear them pitch. And then also hopefully have some time for, for questions and um, for some audience participation of some sort. So I will give you a short introduction um, from, from me and my team on what Enam is. Some of you might have uh, you know, randomly <laughs> found this link or been invited to the live stream by a friend or so, and you might not know who's, who's organizing this. So I'd like to explain. And I'll also tell you what happened this week because these startups have gone through a pretty intense week. So I think it'd be nice to know uh, what they've been up to. We'll then um, hear directly from the startups. So every one of the 13 Admiral Camp um, finalists has three minutes for a pretty short, clear pitch. And then a couple of minutes questions from our jury. I will then do a quick recap so you can remember who's been uh, presenting. And the jury will go in a brief evaluation session to decide um, who to give a couple of prizes to. During that time, I would invite you to stay tuned because we will have um, the opportunity to hear from a very charismatic material scientist. Her name is Dina Dalahi Chinker. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Who will talk about opportunities and challenges that startups in our field are facing during this time and what they are also likely to be facing in the next years as a sort of follow-up to the corona crisis. We'll then wrap up with a couple of words from the head of the Enam board, Dr. Ferdinand Bartels, and we will announce uh, some prizes. And that's that, closing remarks, and we'll let you all go and enjoy a hopefully very nice Friday evening. At this point, usually I'd ask people if they're on board with me, if they're okay with this, but I can't. So please uh, write some things in the comments just to know you're, you're with me. And yeah, grab a drink, relax. It's Friday afternoon and we'll get started. 
So I mentioned before, many of you probably already know, but uh, who we are is we're the Innovation Network for Advanced Materials. We are um, based in Berlin. And our mission is to support innovative ideas, products, processes in the field of advanced materials. Now, it's a little bit difficult to define advanced materials. We've tried and we try at almost every event. Um, and we try not to define it too much because then it's, uh, it becomes limiting. But you will see from the presentations of our startups that it's a pretty broad field. It spans across um, a very wide variety of industries. It can be anything from med tech to industrial applications. Um, you will see even applications in the space industry. So it is quite broad, but the name kind of says it. It's anything to do with material science, anything related to products, processes in this field, hardware, new manufacturing methods, better ways of doing things, um, and so on. And our goal as a network is to connect the dots between corporate startups and research institutes and bring everyone together so that we see innovation and advanced materials happening at a faster pace. You can find us at enam.berlin and you can write us an email if you are from a company in this field um, or if you are a startup trying to make it in advanced materials, we'll be happy to, to try to support you. To give you an idea who is in our network at the moment officially, so we have a lot of unofficial partners as well, um, companies and people that we work with that represent our extended network. I'm pretty sure many of them are, are watching now as well. Um, but officially in our network, we have 16 um, companies. So that can be either large corporations like Sony or Bosch or smaller companies, smaller medium enterprises. Uh, we have four research institutes and 19 uh, startups that are official members and hundreds of other startups that we've, we've worked with over the past um, almost six years now, five, five or so years. So, what we do for our members, once we have uh, someone joining the network, we try to support them in all ways. Since we're a network, the main thing we try to do is connect them best we can. If they are a corporate member, we try to find the startups that would match their interests that they can then um, work in collaboration with. We organize custom events, as I'll show you in a second. Uh, we give our members access to events such as Accelerator, AdmaCom that we organize once a year, such as this program right here, AdmaCamp, um, and of course, an access, access to, to our database um, that we've built up over the years. After this program, AdmaCamp, we will be continuing this year with our yearly Accelerator program, which is called very similarly to AdmaCamp, AdmaCom, just to confuse you. It stands for Advanced Materials Competition, and this will be the fifth year that we run it, but the first time that we run it online. So hopefully this moment right now is a learning experience for, for me, for uh, Chris and Christina as well, to, to learn a bit how to do these kind of events and to do them better. Um, so, so far we've had 45 startups go through our accelerator. They've come from 18 countries and hopefully they've all learned a lot. I see some of them uh, saying hi in the comments now, so that's nice. So this is also something that we try to do, to keep very close in touch with all the startups that we supported over the years and also bring them back to mentor the new startups. So many of our AdmaCamp participants today would have had mentoring sessions from past participants in AdmaCamp, if that makes sense. Another thing I briefly mentioned earlier, we do custom events. So those events can look like open innovation challenges, for example. Um, this is not entirely a new concept. So the idea of open innovation is for companies to be open about their innovation process and allow, for example, startups or research institutes to collaborate to them so that they can build new cool things together. So this is something we're also trying to work more with our members to do. Um, and in that process to support startups and advanced materials so that they can find new collaboration partners. If maybe you are from a large company and you're thinking, oh, our R&D department could benefit from this, get in touch and we'll tell you more. We also organize these for non ena members. Um, I think this is important to mention. So do let us know if uh, this is something that might be interesting for you. You can find also more information on our website. 
And finally, before I stop talking and we get to the interesting part, which are the startups, I do want to mention that we have a podcast. And since so many things are happening online now, including this event, I'm guessing you have access to internet since you can watch this. So you also have access to our podcast, which is called Startup to Science. Uh, many of our startups are featured there. They're very quick, very, uh, I want to say fun. They're kind of fun episodes, especially some of them. Um, yeah entertaining episodes where you can uh, listen to, to our startups. We've also recently started doing expert episodes uh, where we feature usually members of our network, but not only, um, but experts in different fields that we think are, are important for the startups to, to listen to, such as IP strategy, how to build your network, how to write a good business plan, really very crucial information for, for startups across the board, but probably very much so for advanced material startups, because that's our focus. So find us, listen to us, share all that stuff. Okay, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to switch to our startup. So here's how this is going to go. Every startup has three minutes, just three. They go by so fast, you guys, so fast. And just to emphasize how fast I have brought a device from home. It looks like so. You might recognize it from your yoga classes. Um, and what we're going to do is every three minutes, as, as the startups finish their pitch, I'm also going to set my timer. I'm going to bang this thing. And it's going to make this very annoying noise or calming, depends on how you want to view it. And um, that is when you as a startup know I must stop talking. And then we switch to, um, to the jury. I have a couple of more slides before we start, which I didn't realize. So let me just go back to those. I do want to tell you what happened during Adma Camp. So first of all, um, I said it was a one week program. So what the startups got during this time is advice from investors. We had an investor workshop. So thank you to Marie and Wilhelm who gave that workshop. We had a pitch training taught by Serena, who I think is also here. I think I saw a comment from her. So thank you, Serena. Um, we had lots of mentoring sessions, I think about 120 mentoring sessions, so that's quite a lot. So thank you to all the mentors. And then we had an IP workshop with Konstantin and Sven, um, and then we have the online demo day. Now, we have three prizes that we're going to give out towards the end of this two and a half-ish hour event. And those are, one of them is offered by 24 IP Law Group. Um, and that is exclusive IP consultation services. Super important for startups that need patents, like all of you. Um, the second one is a workshop in how to better develop your business plan and um, your marketing plan. This will be delivered by um, Continental, by Contitech actually, which is a division of Continental. And then the third prize is a three month professional Motion Lab membership in case you don't know Motion Lab, it's a space here in Berlin that supports hardware startups, and they've kindly offered um, this prize for one of our startups. Good. I'd now like to announce who's going to be on the jury, just so you all know who gets to make this decision. And um, I'd like to ask all the jury members, and hopefully they're ready on the call, to wave, say hi, maybe say hi for like a second so that we can see your, your faces popping up on the, um, on the live stream as well. So first of all, we have Marie Asano from High Tech Grinder Funds. Hi, Marie. Hi. <laughs> then we have Wolf Hackinson from the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory, or as we like to call it, INL. Hello, everybody. Good luck today. Then we have Robert Harrison from 24IP Law Group. Hi there, all the best. Thank you, Robert. And then we have Wilhelm Hüttenes from Hüttenes Dreihoch. Hi, Wilhelm. Hello, all together. <laughs> and finally, last but not least, we have Martin Ratajak, I'm going to say. I never know how to pronounce this name from Inuru. Hi, guys. Not least, you heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Martin. So these are our five jury members. Um, we, we tried to have like a diverse Jerry, as you can see, so we have someone from the research world, someone from the startup world, like Martin. We have people that know a lot about IP. We have Marie, who knows a lot about, and Wilhelm, who knows a lot about how to find the right startups to invest in. So it's pretty diverse. So your pitches, guys, and I'm talking to the startups, should also be um, kind of geared towards a diverse audience. As you know, we've already talked about it. 
All right, good. Now I'm actually going to go to the startup pitches. So what I'm gonna do is set my timer for three minutes. I'm not gonna play the gong again because you heard it, but you know it's coming. And we're gonna start. The first startup that I'm gonna ask to come and present is Deed. So whenever you're ready, feel free to share your screen and you have three minutes. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That's a good point. Hold on. It's all part of the uh, online experience, guys. OK, can you hear me, see me? Me, my face, and my screen? We see, we hear you. We're good. OK, perfect. OK, I'm okay. going to tell you when you can start. You can start anytime. OK, let's go. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Eduardo Barini, CEO and Deed co-founder. And I'm here to introduce you GET, an available hero to create the perfect system integrator between human and digital. Uh, this is our relation that show us clearly the wrong behavior that we have with the screen addiction to the mobile screen and how much time we pass on it. So for this reason, we create a new communication icon with screenless, with less technology, with a faster interaction. We exploit bones conduction technology to avoid uh, uh, audio contents directly without speaker or head or headphones. And we have we provide the biometric authentication of the user by HEG and fingerprint recognition that enable has also the payment uh, functionality. We invest a lot in high tech material to, to have a new kind of product also in the market, totally customizable for B2B and B2C. We're now wor working on a second product more focused on the medical field and uh, in face on the COVID-19. Uh, we had a big, uh, we, we're going to have a big production on the end of this year, but we already have a little one the last years and we exploit it. We make our better to find and have new clients like Spotify, Maxi Museum, and also validation on Kickstarter where more 1000 people pre-order our products. That allows automatically to to gain interaction with the most important clients that we are interested in too. And uh, for example, uh, this just to give an idea how much is the potential about our platform with all features managed by the platform that can be placed also in many other different verticals clients that we can achieve really easily, I have to say. Uh, for this reason, we have different cross-selling or white label solution, We're looking for new pilot project with indeed the support also of many different international and national grants. Revenue model is totally based on the software and services customization data, data analysis. Uh, bracelet can be sold directly, leasing or peer-to-peer -peer solution. We, however, are still very interesting in the B2C market for a, a big margin and a, a really competitive price also for the, for the product. Uh, the world market see that wearable devices are 80% on the list. So basically also with a small penetration on a wearable device with a million sales preview next year, it's going to be really interesting for our revenue. We invest a lot in research and development. So uh, we will keep also now, because we have the team, the right team, also intellectual property protection. Uh, traction about our pre-seed run with our investor that most of them we are going to make a follow-up. Traction by Kickstarter and first revenue on B2B and also many interesting prizes and awards with many people tested. Two million value, at, we are looking for two million and the I strategy, exit strategy with the IPO and acquisition strategy. And this is the crazy team that's going to be make everything. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Eduardo. I saw how you very gracefully ignored the sound, but just this is it, just so you all know it's gonna happen again. I didn't know really, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You were almost in time, so perfect. We have time for, uh, I think, one question. So I'm going to ask Marie um, for her question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Absolutely, yes. So um, wearables are a very competitive market with many yeah. key players. And with if I understood your pitch correctly, your key USP is quick communication using bone conduction and screenless, right? So what is your key USB in which application do you want uh, to have this utilized in? 
yeah, it's true. Uh, bonds conduction in one of the features that he, that we can really offer, uh, uh, give with our product. So basically, only with this, uh, the strong authentication and uh, all the fitness, wellness, and health tracking, we can really have different uh, features to give to different clients. Uh, for example, in the Gris company, we can really use the products, the, the bracelet, uh, as a, a badge to open the door, uh, to have the check-in and check out every time that we get off from the ship. We can have also, as well, the fitness tracker, fall detection and alert as well as family tracker with, because I go in holiday with my children or something like that. So it's really open. It's quite, the, the most interesting thing is that with the platform, you can add uh, many different also digital solutions. This is really, this is really interesting. Uh, for example, also for the Maxi Museum, uh, we also work for the Evan uh, data that is more focus on the, the flow of people that were in the in the spaces, how much time they stay in different spaces, which installation works better. So we work really a lot also with the data that we collect to better understand how it works and to also give advice to, to give a, a better experience to the clients. But if you had to choose one killer application, I mean, museums, crews, luxury, fitness, these are all very diverse markets. But if you had one killer application, which will make your key USP shine, which one would it be and why? Uh, indeed, uh, it's going to be the first client that we can have. It's also about the telco communication because they are looking for user experience. So indeed, the, the bonds conduction is one of the most interesting. Okay, that's all we have time for, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. I'm going to clap for you, even though it's weird that I'm alone clapping, but that was a very good presentation. Thank you very much. We're going to switch to Filipari, if they're ready. Yeah, hi, everyone. I okay. have to share my screen. Yes, I'm just going to go ahead and share your screen, and I'll start the timer as soon as you're ready. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. I'm Francesca from Filipari. Filipari is an Italian startup born from the desire to create deep connection between Italian territory and the textile sector. The concept starts from a natural element typical, the, the, typical of the territory, such as marble. Marble has, busy, has been used in art, architecture, and represent a cultural, economical, and geological heritage. But if you think that marble is the commercial name of calcium carbonate, you understand that there are a lot of other applications in the field of chemical, pharmaceutical, food, and so on. But in the textile sector, it was never been used. The stone industry produces in Italy more than 3 million of tons of leftover every year with a high cost of disposal and the necessity to find a new solution. Marmor is now wearable thanks to Marmor, is a patented marble-based microfilm that could be coupled with any type of natural artificial on synthetic fabrics. But why marble? Marble gives the natural color, replace the chemical agent. Marble also improves the high abrasion resistance performance. And the calcium carbonate gives to the material a soft, light, and comfortable touch feeling. The project has several advantages. We have two patents, both of product and process. The material is easy to produce because we use existing machinery and is in outsourcing, ensuring flexible and light company structure. We create a cross synergy between Stone District and the textile industry, and the material is very versatile and could be used in the field of transport, furniture, or fashion. We started to use it in apparel through our own women's wear collection of raincoat and skirts. The collection represents a strategic asset to understand the interest on the market and the material wearability. But the second, the second step was to give the patent license to a big textile company that can produce and commercialize the material to other fashion brands that are interested in. The next steps involves the internationalization of the patent the go-to-market in the footwear sector, 
and the go-to-market in the furniture one. Our business model is based on double activities. On one side, we want to sell the material in a B2B channel, in apparel, footwear, and furniture. But on the other side, we have the collection, and we want to sell in B2C, the women's wear collection, and we're adding also the men's wear area. Uh, I'm Francesca, I have a fashion background and an experience in project management. Alice is the other co-founder and she is specialized in product development. We were in Polyhub and uh, uh, the last member of the team is Bruno Pennino, the business and strategy mentor. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. We just have to say that, unfortunately, I mean, I noticed in time, your slides were not moving and we know you have such pretty no. So maybe I'm when I'll ask you to I don't know why. It's okay. These things happen. <laughs> and I think people are understanding of problems online. Maybe what I'll ask you to do is just if we can try again and you just go through the slides, maybe without necessarily presenting them, just because they're so nice and it's not really fair if you don't get to present them. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Let's try one more time just to go quickly through them. Antonia, I don't understand. Uh, can I block my share screen? No, you just have to click on basically changing the slide down here. Uh, so in this, exactly. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's why. Okay. So, um, hmm. maybe you can just quickly for one minute go through some of your favorite <laughs> parts of the <laughs> 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 Uh, Maybe show us some samples of the of the material. Yeah, this is the material that is marmor. It's a semi-finished product made with a real marble. We use marble for natural color. We improve the abrasion resistance of the material, and the, and uh, we made a soft touch feeling thanks to the calcium carbonate that is inside the sole. Thank you very much. I don't know about that, but this is a good warning for the guys. No, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so let's take um, one question from the jury. Martin, do you have a question for uh, for Francesca? Yes, I do have a question. Hi, Francesca. Nice pitch, uh, although the slides <laughs> were a little bit delayed. Uh, anyhow, um, I mean, I understand that marble has a good appealing, right? The customers and the, the structure looks pretty good. But uh, why would somebody want to use your material, meaning the customer, and how do you want to approach the market? What's your go-to-market strategy, like in short detail, three milestones? Okay. Uh, we decide to use marble because it has uh, several performances and uh, also aesthetic effect. The color of the microfilm depends from the marble that we choose. So we can choose the white Carrara one, we can choose the Rosso Verona. In Italy, we have a lot of uh, marble. So uh, it depends on the marble that you choose. Uh, marble improve also the abrasion resistant, make it high abrasion resistant. So you can use it in different fields, such as uh, apparel, furniture, or maybe footwear. Uh, I think that our material could be competitive on market because we have uh, uh, two focus. The first one is the sustainability and the second one is the performance. So it's a technical material uh, that could be very versatile. Okay, and how would you approach the market? So what's, what's your, let's say, go-to-market strategy in three milestones, three words? Okay, we started uh, with a collaboration with a big company. It's a textile company that can produce and commercialize. So we activate a license, the patent license. Uh, and thanks to this license, we can commercialize with this big company. Uh, we are a startup, so we are very small and we have to collaborate with big brand that wants to use the material. So open innovation is now one of the uh, good option to go to the market. And uh, the next level will be to um, produce in outsourcing, but commercialize by ourselves. So we can have more margin and uh, we can grow up better. Okay, thank you so much. 
Thank you both. Um, and thanks for being patient with us with the slides and for sharing them again. And guys, make sure your slides are working now. The next one's coming up. <laughs> thanks a lot, Francesca. I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen and then we'll ask. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. And then we'll ask uh, Garnet to come up next. If you're ready. Do we have Garnet here? Um, yes, I'm here. I'm just trying to share the screen. Go ahead and share your screen and I'll start the timer whenever you're ready. Um, doesn't seem to work properly. I don't know why. Unfortunately, this is one of another. Uh, let me just. Do you want to share your camera and pitch without slides, maybe? Well, the... <laughs> Hold on. Let's see what uh, um, while you try that, I can try to find your presentation and we can share that. I'm sorry this is happening. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry this is happening too. I changed it. Uh, that's the reason I'm... Um... Okay. Guys, everybody else, uh, have a look and make sure your presentation is ready. In the meantime, what I will do is, if you want, I can share my screen and present the previous presentation you sent to us. Not really. It doesn't really make sense. Um, if someone else can go next, um, okay, I'll just try to that. maybe send let's it to you. Yeah. No worries. Okay, the next one up was AC Biod. Maybe we can switch to you and then okay. we'll come uh, back. Just a moment. Sure. <laughs> These things do happen. So everyone just take a breath. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna show my screen. Yes, please. Moment. I didn't open my file, so I have to. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's all right. Um, moment. I have a feeling that on Friday afternoon, everyone is more relaxed and not too impatient. I hope I'm not wrong. Everyone is now going crazy. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, I think. So I'm going to mute and you can present. So can I start? Yes. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Tadashi from AC Bio from Japan. And we have catalyst to create circular economy on plastic waste. As you know, uh, like islands in the ocean, Ocean plastic waste and from the airline, the municipality is one of the biggest challenges. There are three methods to recycle plastic waste. Uh, material recycling, you know, mechanical recycle and thermal chemical recycling. However, there's big problems actually because a lot of waste, organic waste and plastic waste are mixed, contaminated and multi-layered. It is quite difficult to mechanically recycle but if we bring them to um, uh, incinerators or landfills, the issues on dioxin, greenhouse gas emission, tar, as well as high capex and opex, because incinerator requires a high temperature like uh, 1000 degrees Celsius or more. So here's, uh, I'd like to uh, propose chemical recycling that can recycle the non-recyclable non plastic waste, turn them into uh, biofuels, carbon and virgin plastic materials rather than sending the waste all the way to incinerators or landfills. So this is a decentralized way to recycle a plastic waste. And we have two different catalysts. The first one is we named the Kasumi, the one we are ready, ready to sell and patent it. We carbonize the waste that is mixed between organic and plastic. We don't need to separate and turn them into carbon, which will be recycled. The, the other one is we are still developing that to decompose plastic waste, such as PET, uh, PP, and PE from polymer to monomer, virgin materials. 
uh, we already have a partner to, for the machines, a mixer and feeders that can accept up to 24 tons per day. It is usual, but let me skip today. So there are four advantages. One is a decentralized eco-friendly solution. That means the clients can save waste shipment costs and tipping fees, and also good for island or off-grid areas as well. And we can up to 50% reduce the energy cost because of the lower temperature of the action. And the zero greenhouse gas emission and dioxin. And clients can also sell the carbon generated from the waste, such as for this biofuel, carbon, and industrial purposes. The market is growing. It's going to 19 billion US by 2026. And our business model that is simple. We are a fabulous company and it manufactures through OEM and sell. In the long run, we want to provide licensing. Here's our traction. And let me skip this. And here's the last slide. Uh, we have five members on the two, three engineers and myself. I was an investor on this industry in the long run. Thank you. That's perfect. I didn't even have to use my gong, even though I really enjoy it. OK, I will now ask the jury for one question. Um, maybe I'll ask Wilhelm if he has a question for Tadashi. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I, I understood that you have two machines ready already. Um, so uh, I, uh, when you, how, how is your actual go-to market strategy in this case? You said your final goal is licensing, but how are you going to conquer the market with your machines? Uh, Do yes. you have a pilot we, customer? Yes, we already sold one pilot customer in Japan and it got a good result. We already received five LOIs in France, Dubai, and one in Singapore through uh, my networking and also accelerate the program like, you know, so we are getting uh, some contact and inquiries. And in the long term, we want to provide the licensing to chemical or catalyst company in each area. So the main revenue that you are creating is from, uh, from licensing, from producing and then licensing these machines, if I understood that uh, correctly. Uh, no, uh, in the short term, we will sell machine and catalyst. Yep. And the catalysts are subscription model because they need to replace regularly. And then in the long term, we want to provide licensing. Not, not soon, because first we want to sell. Thank you very much. How much are, uh, are you planning to raise in this investment round? Uh, we have already secured 400,000 euro and I'm going to raise additional 150,000. Perfect, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Okay, you guys are very disciplined time-wise, which is something that makes me very happy. Okay, <laughs> we're now going to move on to another startup. So just to remind you, we have 13 startups in total, so that's quite a few. So I'm going to try to take some breaks at some point, but I think we can go through a couple more. So next up, we have uh, Blacktop Labs, if they're ready. Yep. Perfect. Anytime you're ready, Tanya, you can share your screen. Same, same drill. Okay, can you see it? We can, yes. And does it change? Yeah. Cool. All right. Hi, we're Blacktop Labs. It's our mission to optimize athletic training and rehabilitation. So I'm the CEO, I'm Tanya Colonna, and on the call also is Hobie Tam, he's our CTO. We met in engineering school. After that, I went on to do a lot of stuff in business development. Hobie got his PhD in biomedical engineering. But our entire lives, we've been athletes, but we've actively avoided cardio. We actually challenged ourselves last year to run a 65 kilometer race. This is kind of what our training plan looked like. It was six months intensive, experienced a lot of fatigue, injury, and we weren't sure if we were able going to be able to finish. We did, it took us over eight hours, but it took first place less than five hours. And we thought, okay, if we try again, what should we do differently? And we had no idea. So this happens a lot within athletic training. You know what you need to do. You know all the variables you change. You train, you evaluate success and competition. 
but you have no clear direction in how to actually change what you need to do to be better. And we envision a world where muscle recovery data is that guide and it pushes human potential. We have a sensor system that monitors muscle activity. We can put six of them together and then through the software platform, analyze how your muscles are actually responding to training. All of this is done wirelessly. And if you measure how your muscles respond, you can train to optimize that adaptive response. It's easy to use, two minutes to apply, use it in the gym, get your actionable metrics. And with this, we can create personalized thresholds and build up to using artificial intelligence. We've strategically placed our company within the market and we plan to actually target very specific markets as we expand so that we can eventually have a total addressable market of around 1 billion euro. And with that, we expand with validation necessary, reducing costs, really specifying what the market needs. Strength athletes are willing to pay for this right now. We've interviewed over 30 of them, 30% world we ranked, 100% overtrained due to lack of data, and 28 out of 30 are willing to pay for this right now. We've been validating the hardware and software with key opinion leaders for one and a half years, and we're continuing iterative design with customer feedback. Our plan is to sell B2C directly to athletes and coaches with a hardware and a monthly subscription model that's price differentiated based on which market we're going into. Here's an overview of our financials. We have enough runway to get us through uh, March of next year. We plan to break even around 2023 and we want to exit with a uh, fitness tracking company. So with that, we also have more support. We have a perpetual worldwide exclusive license of these sensor systems with our firmware developers and also working on a dry electro technology. Then we've raised 400K. We have business support as well, as well with Enom now. And we have been testing this, like I said, with a top tier physiotherapy practice and Hobie has also been testing it a lot during quarantine. Our ask is for 800K so that we can push marketing and sales, hire more people onto our team. And we're also looking for an adhesive patch design if Enom has any connections. And boom. <laughs> Sorry, I just really wanted to do that. I realized you were already done. All good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tanya. I really uh, liked your presentation. I particularly like that uh, Hobie has been testing it on himself. I will, <laughs> I will ask Wolf now uh, to ask any questions from the jury. Thank you for a lovely presentation. And my first question relates to the exclusivity and the supply you have for the sensor. How sensitive are your business model to that relationship? Uh, that's a good question. So with, with that, we've been working with the supplier for two and a half years, and it's really helping us reduce the cost of goods. We could technically farm out to other people or move it in-house, but I think for right now that real cost reduction is really helping us penetrate the market within athletics since that strategic positioning that I showed you, it really helps us get to a price point where the market's willing to pay. Interesting. And how can you then using this kind of moment and keep other uh, competitors outside your uh, region of interest? Uh, well, with that, we also have a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews. So I mentioned the, the market scaling. It's not that we've only done customer interviews within the strike training. We've been searching for these early customers for a long time right now. So we have a lot of connections within uh, neuromuscular disorders, within knee rehabilitation, within top tier teams. I've interviewed the Dutch national football team, hockey team, tennis federation, as well as the Olympic skating team here and some top teams in Belgium and in Italy. So I think with those connections, those one-on-one -on -one connections, really understanding the market, that's going to be one of our main value propositions on top of that, uh, the data, the shared data that we're collecting over time with this algorithm that we're developing and really feeding the algorithm. I think that's gonna help really secure a position in the market as well. Thank you for these clarifying clarifications. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. So we've heard so far guys, sorry, I'm uh, trying to stop my timer so that nothing rings. Okay. Thanks all for the presentation so far. Just to do a quick recap, we've heard from um, Deed, who are working on a very cool new wearable device. We've heard from Filippari, who told us how we can make a fabric out of marble or using marble, which is pretty cool. Um, then we heard from Tadashi about AC Biod, which to be very honest, I would try to explain in a couple of words, but it would be too difficult for a non-scientist. So I'm just hoping you are paying really good attention to his presentation. 
And then we heard just now from Tonya, from Tanya from Blacktop Labs um, about um, the way they are trying to help athletes perform better and push the boundaries of human potential. So I think that was very, very cool. I want to see if we had any questions on the live stream, apart from the questions we got from the jury. I think we had one uh, for Eduardo from Deed earlier, which was uh, maybe Eduardo, if you want to take this question really quick. How do you motivate people to switch from their usual device, from their smartphone now, or from whatever other devices they have, uh, to start from scratch and learn how to use a new type of technology? Have you thought about that? How are you going to motivate people to start using your product? Do I have Eduardo on the line or have I lost him? We have lost him. No, he's here. Eduardo, can you hear me? Yeah, tell okay. me. <laughs> okay, I'll very quickly repeat. So we had a question on the live stream for you, which was, um, how do you think you're going to motivate people to start using your technology instead of the existing one that they're using now, usually smartphones? Uh, this is on YouTube platform, yeah? The question? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because I, I don't hear so well. How to motivate people to switch from their usual smartphone to start from stress to learn. Uh, I have to say, the, the added value of the product uh, is exactly that uh, we really have a faster interaction with many different uh, features. Uh, and the most of all important things is that imagine only the WhatsApp audio notification, you can directly receive the bracelet vibrate, you listen, and after you can directly answer without touching anything. So Eden, uh, same things is about the payments. Uh, we're starting to see in the metro station that you can pay with a credit card or something like this. You don't, you don't need to pick up the phone or the, or the wallet. You can directly pay with the bracelet. So basically, it's many different fast interaction that can really help to have this uh, opportunity to exploit the, the, this product in this way. Got it. Okay. Hopefully that explanation is clear. And I really do hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm doing my best. I have a special microphone and everything. Okay. Thanks a lot, Adarda. Good. Welcome. So we're going to keep going. As I said, we have 13 startups. So hopefully you're all still awake. Um, not in like Friday festive mode, but still in Friday super attentive mode. So we're going to go next to Coltec. Hello. Yes. Hi, Martin. So you can share your screen whenever you're ready. And yes. I'm timing you. Okay. Perfect. We can see your slides. So it should all be fine. Super. Uh, yeah. Today we are talking about uh, nature friendly disinfection of viruses. Uh, my name is Martin Shen. I represent the company Coltech. So we are uh, focusing on a problem which is destroying the viruses on the surface in the public areas in the large volumes, regularly and cost efficiently. Imagine yourself um, you use a soap for personal use at home, works perfect. When you enter the, or attend the supermarket, you clean your hands with the liquid containing alcohol. Also works perfect, but when it comes to the large, large areas, then uh, nobody will use probably those technologies. There are different ones. And uh, our value, what we see is that we can open the restrictions, existing restrictions um, earlier. We can be uh, environmentally safe and we do it with a natural product. Uh, the team behind uh, comprising the scientific and managerial um, knowledge are four people. Uh, I would say that the idea is developed in the uh, University of Russia, and we definitely have 40 plus years in the development of uh, different protective materials, as well as military and nuclear industries. So there are much more people behind us than you can see here in the slide. Uh, today, there are several uh, technologies existing. Um, here, I just listed three of them, uh, most popular ones, say sodium chlorophyte, and um, those are applied to uh, surfaces today. 
but when it comes to large areas again, it's costly. Therefore, we have developed our know how to make environmentally friendly and water based disinfector with adjustable pH um, value, which is applied uh, on the surface and disable virus from the further viability. So even it will fall also in a, in a soil, in a park, in a city, it will help and be as a fertilizer for the soil, given that we have acid rains and our soil basically is acid. Uh, our basic advantages are it's a natural product, uh, given that it's 99% water-based. Um, it is cost efficient for um, production on site in a large amount so that we can deliver uh, dry mix to the site. And only delivery costs of the dry mix to the site occur because the material itself is uh, very uh, cheap in a way. Our unique selling point is a method of produ production uh, for the different type of base material because um, the base material are different in different uh, corners of the world. But here you can see the map where we can get it. So. I'm sorry, that was uh, my super special gong. So I'm afraid yeah. I have to stop you there. But I think we all got the the main ideas and I think we all want this product to work and be available. I'm going to start with uh, a question from Marie. Hello. So Martin, thanks for your presentation. Um, I like your environmentally friendly spin and I think that's really important. Um, the question I would have is, uh, well, since it's 98% water, you said, I know that viruses can be hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Does your disinfectant um, product address all kinds of viruses? What, well, sorry, what types of viruses do you want to, to target? And what is the steps, developmental steps, your company is going to go through to validate that it does what it's supposed to do? Uh, first of all, we are uh, talking about uh, hydrophilic. So they uh, have, um, given that uh, the virus is giving, is a fat lipid shell, uh, this uh, product uh, creates the environmental uh, film, which is, is alkaline environment. And uh, we will test, uh, it will, um, we will test on, uh, on the known um, viruses, which are, uh, say, listed uh, for the, those technologies which are most popular at the moment. And our uh, laboratory tests in the future, of course, will cover all the rest what will come. So the, there's an unlimited number of viruses and uh, we will keep uh, testing them. But what about lipophilic, uh, lipophilic viruses like herpes or influenza? I cannot answer this question at the moment. So um, to be honest. Okay, but you have sort of a road plan where you intend to address certain types of viruses because obviously you have to go past regulatory authorities. Absolutely. If you're Absolutely. selling a product, okay. Definitely. So we're in the very beginning of the road, as you see, uh, we haven't defined our pricing strategy as well since uh, we haven't uh, talked with the our customers, we have to still find the cost structure of our customers, so it will come. And you did mention uh, cost efficiency as one of your key USPs. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how much, you're, I mean, for sure you said you need to work on your pricing strategy, but what kind of you know costs we're talking about here for your product and how much your competitor's product costs? Uh, say there are different, uh, different uh, technologies, say um, sodium hypochloride, one cubic meter costs nine euros per cubic meter. Well, we can do it below, below one euro, definitely. So that's really immense um, uh, price difference, but uh, I wouldn't uh, talk much about the numbers because I don't know the cost structure. Okay, but That's you're, the point. you're confident that you can get it more or less the Absolutely. same level or lower. I mean, yeah. I think yeah. that's the key thing, right? Yes, this is because, because basically uh, the places where we are getting the material are giving the material, base material 
away for free. Okay. Antonio, you're going to have to stop me. I'm going to keep on asking questions unless you stop me. Yes, I was just about to stop you, okay. um, but I didn't want to interrupt you too abruptly. Okay, <laughs> thank you both very much. Thank you, Marie, for the questions and thanks for answering them so patiently. We will now move to Mesh, who I hope are ready. Can't wait to present. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I'm going to ask you now. Yes, everyone else can please mute and stop sharing your slides. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Not yet. No. No. Okay. Oh, hold on. I can I can see it if I switch from the top. I think it would help us a lot, Martin, if you stop presenting. Is it um, maybe it's better if I kill my video? No, no, it's fine. It's no, you don't have to do that. How about now? Can you see the screen? I mean, I can see it, but hold on. <laughs> Sorry, everyone is going to have to bear with us. Um, I think we can see it now. Perfect. OK, you can start. You have three minutes. Great. So we are MESH, a group of building physics experts and architects. Buildings account for 40% of energy consumption in Europe. Sorry, and we can't see the screen. We can't see the screen. Really? Mm. Uh, why? Just give me a second to, to stop the video to see if the, yeah, it's now uh, come it's now come through. Can you see it? Can you see it now? Yes. Good. Great. Okay. Round two. Let's start again. Okay. So uh, buildings account for forty percent of energy consumption in Europe and fifty percent in the US. In addition to this, in Europe, refurbishment is responsible for almost 60% of the total workload of architecture operations. In these conditions, the improvement of energy performance is one of the key objectives of intervention in existing buildings, as well as in the design of new developments. EU-wide surveys capture the need for innovation in the market, and this is even more evident in the south of Europe, where almost 50% of building stock was built between the 60s and the 90s without any insulation whatsoever. By 2030, more than 80% of our buildings should be energy efficient or renovated. In the context of this challenge, a deep renovation wave is envisaged in the EU Green Deal. Furthermore, we are expecting building renovation to be accelerated under the InvestEU initiative. MESH responds to this opportunity in the building sector with an innovative facade system which combines high adaptability and multifunctionality with cost effectiveness. MESH dynamically modulates the building shading and ventilation with generating solar electricity and offering aesthetic interactive lighting. MESH moves beyond the use of standardized cladding and single function building schemes through its nature inspired design, operating like the scheme to regulate absorb and communicate with the environment. The units of mesh are combined into unique matrices in order to respond to the specific conditions of each individual building of application and its site. Every set of units performs in a complementary way and thus the emerging performance of mesh is greater than the sum of the individual functions. Mesh pipeline leverages capacity of local fab labs, parametric design and digital simulation to enable a distributed production model. MESH will employ a certified business model with a legacy design to construction service pipeline. A rough estimate of the total available market of MESH in Europe is 2.6 million of square meters of facade area per year for the next 30 years. MESH facade with a projected cost of 300 euros per square meter will offer to investors a payback period of three to five years due to cooling down the building. MESH will transform the built environment of our neighborhoods and make the space we live in enjoyable, comfortable, and resilient. MESH will smarten up our tired building stock to make it green, fun, and interactive to the environment and street life. Thank you very much. So close. So close to mm -hmm. the <laughs> Thank Just you so much. It. It's very nice. And I like how you ended on this very positive note of how much will change our lives in a good way. So I'd like to take one question from the jury as we do, this time from Marcin, if he's ready with a question. 
Uh, yes, so thank you very much for the presentation. My question is, I mean, uh, first of all, your product, it changes the way how the facade looks like. Why should anybody like in the world want to have this type of look at a facade? Uh, well, we are, um, f first of all, uh, there, there are two um, market groups. The, 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 the owners or the engineers commissioned by the owners of existing buildings uh, for uh, renovation and then new developments. In terms of new developments, uh, obviously, in any case, uh, this could be taken into account and a specific, for example, south uh, or um, um, western uh, facade of, of a building could be uh, co uh, covered by, by our uh, skin in order to optimize the energy performance of the whole uh, building. Now, regarding the existing buildings, uh, building stock, uh, which uh, specifically is poorly, uh, we are focusing on those that, that are poorly uh, constructed and insulated. And in most of the times, as in uh, the specific photos that I, I used in my, in my slides, in my presentation, they have uh, very poor uh, architectural and aesthetic quality in any case. So it's not a matter of uh, making it um, um, different. It's, it's a matter of uh, optimizing the performance of the building. And because of all the, the, the gains one would Get, uh, get out of this. Um, obviously, also the with the integration of the uh, interactive uh, lighting would create some playful uh, results that would uh, make the inhabitants uh, or the residents uh, uh, be willing to uh, accept a, a change in the appearance of their building. Okay, I understand. Thank you. So, I mean, what you just said, and, and it confirms my uh, theory, is that you have just narrowed down the market. Uh, you said that it's more probably that new people for new designs will take it, and the other ones, of course, there's a benefit, but you don't know. So, the key question is even for the for the market that is sounding like you know very interesting for me is how do you protect yourself that somebody else is going to do that? I mean, uh, I understand that this is an integrated system out of existing components. There's no uh, material-based IP behind it. Am I correct? Uh, regarding the materials, um, uh, no, we are in contact with uh, various uh, ma uh, material suppliers for, um, for example, for the electrochromic membranes that each one of the many of these components uh, come with their own uh, IP um, and copyrights, but uh, and licenses. Uh, but the for for us, the 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 innovation is uh, in the the license fees that. Uh, uh, one would have to uh, pay in order to, to use the, the pipeline, the workflow as a service. And uh, this would include also the simulation component, the simulation part, and as well as the fab labs, the local fab labs that they would produce and install it. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a very tight and complex and integrated uh, uh, workflow pipeline. But I suppose, um, as we, we heard on, on Monday from some of the, of the mentors, uh, indeed, uh, I hope I convinced you that the, uh, there is going to be the next 10 to 20 years, a huge mar mar market for, for this. So the more companies would uh, you know, focus on renovating our buildings, uh, building, uh, our existing building stock uh, with, uh, with such technologies, the, the better it would be for everyone, for all the companies that would appear. All right. So, I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your questions. Okay, just a quick reminder to the jury. Just one question, okay? No follow-ups. We have to stick to an agenda here. And thanks, Georges. You uh, dealt very well with thanks. my challenging questions. All right. Next up, we have uh, Kemitech. So, Cesar, whenever you're ready. And mm -hmm. Georges, okay. please stop sharing your screen so that Cesar can share it. You know, yes. thing we need to do here. Okay. Okay, you are seeing. And then you can confirm if you see. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cesar Martins. I'm the CEO of Chemitech. Um, Chemitech works mostly with solar panels because what the panels have one big problem that is dust accumulation. As different types of dust, like bird dropping, sun test, and tea dust, can reduce the efficiency of the panels up to 50 percent 
the market issues and the loss of energy is about three to five billion last year. And we have one solution that is solar wash protect. This is a concentrated product that you dilute in water. And with that water, you can clean the panels with machinery or by hand and remove very easily the dust and create anti-static film that repel the dust up to 12 months. We have some examples of the clients and before and after, but most important is the results after, after the cleaning. In this example, in yellow, you see the panels only cleaned by water and in red with water and solar wash protect. And you can see that improve the production uh, in 1.8 to 2.1% in this case. We have other example, for example, in a cement plant that you have hard dust. And after 50 days, you can see the different cleaning only with water and cleaning with our product. And the dust, dust accumulation is not so much. We are already certification by two. We are a warranty from the manufacturers of the panels. Our business model is production of the product and sell B2B. We are already four people and growing. Uh, Pedro for sales, Tanya for R&D, and Emilia for assistant office. Uh, we have a lot of milestones that to achieve in the last two years. We created Chemitech in 2018. We uh, win a lot of, of uh, projects to validate our prototypes. We make a seed run last year. Uh, last year, we finalized the construction of the new factory that have a capacity of five tons per day. And now uh, we already are approval of six of the manufacturers of top 10, more than 100 clients in 40 countries, and we reached uh, last month 340k in sales. And this is everything. Thank you. Wow, even way before time. I'm so impressed with you guys. I think mm -hmm. we're uh, afraid of our time management skills. Thank you very much, Cesar. That was a very uh, clear presentation to the point. So I think that. Um, the jury got very well what you're doing. Let's hear from Robert if he has any questions for you. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, Cesar, for um, giving us that uh, presentation. You showed an article from a website or a magazine suggesting that this was a known problem PV magazine. Thank you. So there's um, that stated 2019, and we know that there are other people working on similar solutions. So the question that I would have to ask you is how do you get the long term sustainable value for this product? Yeah, for now and not about the competitors, we don't have a really direct competitor, only for the washing product. What we have is a washing product that in the same time make a coating to repel the dust. And with that, we are different. We already submitted our patent last year and we have approval from the manufacturers and the warranty that they can use our product and still be valid. And this is our goal now, but we are improving our technology and making some partnerships like robots and machineries for cleaning the panels to close everything uh, possible clients on, and certification in this field. Okay, thanks, Cesar. Right, great. Um, thank you very much again for your presentation, Cesar. So there are a few questions coming from, from the live stream, but I would like to do is keep going through a few more pitches and then we'll stop and take some of them. In the meantime, guys, if you are also watching, so you, the startups, are also watching this on the live stream and you see a question addressed to you, feel free to go and answer it uh, directly on, on YouTube as well. Okay, next up, I'm going to move to MQS, if Mark is ready, and he Yes, is... hi. Can okay. you hear me? I can hear you. You can show okay. your... Okay. <laughs> there's like a background noise behind you, Mark, but I think there's nothing you can do about it, so we'll just push you. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. Shall I start? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can. Yes, I just muted. Okay. Me. Okay, so we are MQS and we simulate molecules in the cloud. 
to develop any new material or substance, you need to understand how chemicals behave. The pharma and biotech industries invest a huge amount of their resources into gaining this knowledge by doing laboratory experiments. And it pays off if a company hits the jackpot by finding a drug against the disease. But the number of potential experiments is virtually endless and an extensive time is required which limits the scope of research. This means that fewer possibilities are explored, a higher chance of failure is given and the final product will enter the market very late. Therefore, we need tools to accurately predict chemical properties. Our platform simulates thousands to millions of molecules faster than any laboratory could handle. We have applied our cloud-based software in collaboration with pharma and biotech companies to help solve their problems. Our tool increased their research efficiency by 30 to 50%. Only this week, we received three new requests for collaboration. Our solution makes use of quantum chemistry simulations. Researchers and engineers can now focus on their main task to develop and analyze new ideas as fast as possible through our collaborative cloud platform. Our users have all easy access to supercomputing power and the structure of a molecule is the only input our tool needs to predict, for example, the solubility of a drug compound. Our SAS B2B product is sold at a flexible license price based on the activated features. The basic pricing aligns with our competitors and we further provide a pay per usage model where the customer is charged per individual request. The price of a request depends on how big and complicated the molecule is. Our first target group on the market are mid-sized companies who will need to efficiently do experiments for larger companies. Assuming a 10% European market share when a, when a single user license is sold per organization, we would make a revenue of 13.5 million euros. And from our surveys, we concluded that existing desktop solutions are inflexible to work with. And for our competitors, it will be very hard to adapt their own product to a cloud-based solution. Our team consists of Lucas and me as the CTO and CEO. We both hold a PhD in chemical engineering and have expertise in quantum chemistry, thermodynamics, and software development. Tao is our skilled backend developer. Saha is our cognition expert. Adam is our UI UX developer. And our two business development advisors are Urs and Christian, who help management positions at Novo Science and IBM. We are concentrating on finalizing our MVP to test the market within the next six months. Right now, we are seeking 400,000 euros in funding for hiring new team members with knowledge in sales, marketing, and software engineering. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Super clear. I think we all know, um, yeah, a lot more about you than the name would have suggested. I'm gonna move on to questions and I'll ask Wilhelm to tell us if he has any questions from the jury for you. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, can you tell me what is the main advantage of um, your software, which is cloud-based, um, to um, the conventional approach for, for instance, um, similar software to do screening via, for instance, DFT or molecular dynamics and relations on supercomputing? So what is your, mm -hmm. the advantage of your cloud-based cloud -based solution over that? Um, so there are two types of models uh, which you can apply. You can use molecular dynamics, which are based on mechanical uh, simulations of molecules. And on the other side, there exist quantum chemistry models, which exactly uh, calculate the um, electron atom uh, uh, structure of a molecule. And from this, we predict with our thermodynamic models, uh, for example, phase equilibria for uh, different um, for different uh, substance systems. And this uh, is way more efficient to do with quantum chemistry than with molecular dynamics. So there's different applications dependent on different models you can uh, cover with. And we cover uh, quantum chemistry based applications and not molecular dynamics applications. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, guys, so just a quick recap since the last recap. We've also heard in the meantime from... Do you mind muting, Mark? Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've also heard from four more startups. So we've heard from Coltech, 
we've heard from Mesh, Chemitech, and MQS. And hopefully you have an idea of what each of them does if you're watching this on the live stream. But to recap, Coltec is working on a solution to help eradicate uh, viruses, disinfect uh, large surfaces very fast. Mesh is working on adaptive architecture, and we saw how they're integrating advanced materials or how they're attempting to do, to do that. Um, Chemitech is helping us keep our solar panels clean for very, very long. I hope I'm summarizing that well enough. And then MQS is developing a very cool software solution for all you material scientists. Cool. So hopefully everyone is with us and you have enough uh, energy and enthusiasm for our final five startups, uh, which are gonna start right now presenting. So I'm gonna go next to Ceramic, Project Ceramic, if they're ready. Yeah, thank you. I try to share my screen. Perfect. Can you see it? Can you also see the full screen? I can see it. Yeah. I can see the slides moving. I think we're all set. I'll set the timer and you can start. So thank you so much. My name is Sebastian von Ceraming. And what I want is to understand you to understand what are the problems of the ceramic industry. Uh, they have an increasing need for highly complex geometries of ce their ceramic parts. And the problem is that the traditional production methods cannot catch up with this increasing needs. The 3D printing technologies that are out there uh, can be an aid, but they lack productivity or quality and they are not always able to process all the ceramic materials that they are out there. The good news is that we can help with our patented layer-wise slurry deposition technology. What we do is um, we deposit a layer of liquid suspension that we dry afterwards, and then go with a printhead over it to glue with a binder the ceramic particles together. If you do that n times, so a couple of times, then you can build up a ceramic part inside a fixed powder bed and afterwards um, wash it out and then sinter it. If you do that, you can get parts like here, this turbine. And when you do it as good as we can do it, you even don't see in the microstructure any layers. Um, what is really interesting about our technology is that it can outperform other existing 3D printing technologies, at least in one of the following dimensions, productivity and quantity and, qu and quality. And the quality is measured here as density of the final ceramic part, because a porous ceramic part is worth nothing. What makes us unique is that our technology is the only one that was purely developed for ceramics and not adapted from other materials. And what we can do is reduce the lead time for printing a 3D ceramic, uh, printed ceramic part up to 60%, which makes it a really economic production met method for highly complex ceramic parts. Our target mark is the world market for 3D printed ceramics. This is a uh, part, uh, this has four sub markets. This is here the red bar. Uh, these are technical ceramic parts that are sold. The yellow one is project based visibility studies and developing products. And the blue ones are uh, machines, uh, 3D printers that are sold as materials. And what you see is that the acceleration of growth is lying ahead of us, which makes it a real emerging market. Our market approach is that we are going to do proof of concept projects in 2021 with suppliers for the automotive industry, for example, to get market validation. And then in 2022, uh, we want to sell technical parts and want to um, give the possibility for service uh, of uh, 3D printed ceramic parts to give the customers the possibility um, to assess our quality. In 2023, we want to get an integrated supplier that also is selling uh, the 3D printers and the um, corresponding materials. The situation now is that we are in the exist transfer of research until March uh, 21. We have an industry uh, prototype ready in summer and are want to found in the end of the year. Now it's important to get industry applications and uh, funding for April 2021. And this is the team that covers all the necessary capabilities. And we are glad to have our two mentors that are worldwide experts for the technology. So thank you. Uh, and don't rest, but invest. I wish you a nice day. And I'm now looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Sebastian. It's a great presentation. Um, I will ask Wolf to ask you a question. 
Thank you, Sebastian, for the nice presentation and an interesting topic as such. Uh, could you comment a little bit on uh, how you see the production possibilities of a new and capability of providing services? I seem, that seems to be very important for you to build up the funds for go to the next step. That's completely right. Uh, especially service will be, as I said, in the direction of feasibility studies and um, really go to the suppliers for industries because I think the corona uh, crisis will um, lead to a situation where the, the industry will pull or will um, give the R&D more to the suppliers. So it's good to have a, a partner like us for 3, 3D printing of ceramics uh, that can then help for developing products in the, for ceramic um, applications. Is this okay as answer? Yeah, thank you so much. Am I, am I allowed to win another one? Antonia. Have another one. We also have one on the live stream, but you can then have... go for the live stream. I've talked enough. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. you. The question on the live stream is: Do we get the desired density, mechanical property in the final product? Exactly. Our big advantage is that we really get the quality that um, yeah we can catch up with traditional production of ceramic parts. Okay. You actually have one more question here, which is. Um, the automotive industry needs high volumes and only a small number of customized geometries. It's not even a question, it's just a statement. So check that in your business forecast. Very good. <laughs> Absolutely agreed. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. And thanks you, uh, thank you all for your question as well. We'll move on now to Danish Graphene, if the guys are ready. Yep, I am. Wonderful. I like, I like hearing that. Sharing my screen will be words that I'll dream of now for uh... <laughs> Okay, whenever you're ready, you can share and I'll start the time. Can you see it? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. Yes, hello, good afternoon. My name is Andreas Bronska Larsen and I am CEO of Danish Graphene. First of all, I would like to turn your attention towards some material issues in industry. Uh, we have a lot of mechanical failure, which leads to costly repairs. We have a lot of static buildup on surfaces, which can in some cases lead to explosive hazards. A lot of heavy materials that we, if you want the strength, we also sometimes get heavy materials, especially in transportation sector. These require a lot more fuel uh, to transport both people and goods all over the world. With that, I would like to introduce you, those of you who are not aware of the material graphene, which is a single atomic layer of carbon atoms. It has some extraordinary properties, which I have highlighted a few of here, the great conductive of conductor of electricity and heat while also having very high strength. There are, however, two main issues with graphene. The first is that large scale production is quite difficult if you wanna maintain a certain quality. And the material is not compatible with other materials, meaning if you put it into a composite, it's difficult to interact with it. But with our production, we have solved both of these issues. Our process is based on electrochemical exfoliation where we simultaneously can functionalize the material. This means we add anchor points to the graphene where we then uh, can customize these to match the surrounding uh, composite, for example, to get a much stronger interaction. The final product in the production is a porous graphene powder, which can very easily be mixed into a polymer blend uh, using simple mixing equipment. The advantages of, of Danish graphene is that we have a, this unique production of customizable solutions where we can really incorporate any functional groups we would like. We do thorough testing of the materials and everything we do is based on scientific, scientific data and we do not give any unrealistic promises. We're very open to collaborations in order to improve uh, the material for your specific application and we deliver a high quality product that is very easy to implement in your existing production. Here I have some data of a test case where we added 0.1% of our functionalized graphene to polyurethane, saw tremendous increases in the uh, strength while the toughness of the material remains the same. And improvements of this size uh, at this load is uh, not seen in other materials. The graphene market, as you probably know, is growing. And um, with our unique uh, combination of electrochemical exfoliation and functionalization, we have a unique process in the market. We're currently in talks with Vestas about a collaboration where they see that we could improve uh, performance, lifetime, lower the material consumption while also giving increased strength. We're working on a few different strategies as how to uh, 
deliver this product, either selling to subcontractors who will deliver a finished solution to the industry or getting material from subcontractors making the solution ourselves, selling it from our side. Here we have the team. I am the full-time CEO, have my technical advisors from the university and an investor team uh, who are actively helping with business development, IP strategy and funding. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Great, let's take uh, one question from the jury. Maybe I'll ask Marie if she has some questions for Andreas. Yep, hold on. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, if I understood correctly, you're going to be basically a CMO for functionalized graphene, for specialized functionalized graphene. What's that one, I mean, and you're going to have many different customers, but what's mm. that one killer application where functionalized graphene is uh, on vogue, it's going to grow, and it's going to be your largest market segment? Um, I'm kind of asking this because I don't think a lot of, many in the audience are professionals or experts in the area, so... That I think that's something that we would like to know. Yeah, so uh, one of the like very specific applications that I'm uh, also have been focusing the most on is on uh, lightweight composites, where when you want increased strength, uh, a lot of the time you can add a lot of different filler components, but these can sometimes compromise the existing matrix and thereby actually worsen the material. Uh, so the addition of our functionalized groups and thereby these uh, easier interactions with the surrounding uh, material uh, means that we can go at much lower loadings so we don't uh, worsen the material by we, we simply just improve the, the the performance and mainly I've like, been looking into like uh, transportation so aviation automotive uh, those sorts of areas where a lot of plastic is used um, currently so yeah improving those areas is a uh... thank you yeah thank you and if we have a moment, Andres, there's also a question on the live stream from Lucas. He's asking, are you producing graphene flakes, graphene oxide, or reduced graphene oxide? And is there a possibility of producing all of these or treating your product into any of these? So we're producing a graphene nanoplatelets, so the flakes, as you would say. We don't produce graphene oxide. Uh, I have also done that previously in my studies, but uh, it's not nearly... Uh, to the same degree of oxidation uh, and we can also customize the functional groups um, unlike graphene oxide where you can simply just oxidize it um, there would be you could if you wanted take our material and change it into graphene oxide if, if you like but um, i would think you would get a worse material if you do that so that's not really uh, ideal okay thank you all right, uh, and I think there are more questions for you, but if you don't mind, I will ask you to take them on the live stream so that we can move on to the next presentation. Yep, I will do that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Perfect. We're going to move next to Siddharth from Tivari. Yeah, Siddharth. I'm here. Hi, Siddharth. So you want to share your screen? Definitely. Just a minute. We can see it. It looks like it's working. It feels like a yeah. victory. And it works. Okay. Start. So good afternoon to everybody. Uh, the company is Tivari Scientific Instruments, and I will be talking uh, shortly about it. So we were founded in 2019. Uh, it's privately owned, 100%, no investors on board, and we are a direct spin-off of the European Space Agency. Because of that, we also have a headquarters in Darmstadt. And uh, we are also active in Berlin Atlasov, uh, which is a very famous place for science and technology. So additive manufacturing, what's the problem here? Price is one of the biggest driving factors here. Additive manufacturing is extremely expensive. If you go and decide, I want to do additive manufacturing today, you have to spend half a million, buy a big machine, and then you are able to work with some materials, not all of them. And there is another hidden thing that nobody tells you. There are additional costs for post-processing. Pure additive manufacturing almost never exists. You always have to have extra machinery. You can go for services, but it's going to cost you 5,000 euros per kilogram for metals or ceramics. There is a lack of standardization. And uh, 
basically conclusion is AM is a luxury, only the big boys can afford it. And the situation is a bit similar to uh, this, the situation in 1984 where Macintosh came in with their user-friendly cheap computer that was there for everybody. And that's what you have to see on, that you see on the right side. And we're trying to do something different. We're trying to break this and make additive manufacturing available for everybody. We all know FDM-based additive manufacturing is cheap. Filaments can be produced. Plastic printers are available and they can print and produce parts for cheap. Now, what if we take these filaments, take the plastic and put some metal or ceramics in them and you're able to produce nice shapes, as you can see in the first step, then remove the plastic with chemical debinding and high temperature sintering. And what is the result? You have pure metal or ceramic parts. One example is this one with stainless steel. Steel being the workhouse of uh, industrial application, it's everywhere. A uh, very beautiful piece demonstrating the fineness of the, uh, of the technology. Another example with silicon carbide. VR, our revenue model is based on uh, providing services. We are doing material development as part of R&Ds. And then in the future, we want to do green machining, which is uh, a state where we are trying to machine and improve the surface quality before the heat treatment when the parts are still small, uh, are still soft. These are the big numbers of AM. AM is growing very well, as you all know, but we are targeting the aerospace application. Why? Because first of all, we are qualifying the technology, first ever company to do that. And from space, we then want to go to Earth because anything that flies can be used on Earth later. We have uh, entered into partnership with a big Japanese company. And uh, fresh news is that we have partnered up also with the Embassy of India to make our technology available also in India. And that's all folks from my side. Big thanks to Enam uh, and for this fantastic chance and the platform to present our company. Oh, thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks for the presentation. We'll take one question from Martin. Just one question, Martin. These are the rules of the game. Just one. Jesus Just Christ. One. I have three. Uh -huh. um, so um, talking about your materials, um, which is the first application that you would like to utilize it in and how big is the market there? So the first application is that we have, we have the best access to the guys in the space industry. So that's where we really are able to get and identify very specific applications. And we have identified one of them for titanium and also for silicon carbide. So we have proceeded with developing prototypes for that. And this is a big challenge because in the space industry, if it's not good enough, it will not fly. So if you're able to get it qualified for that application, then using it on the industrial application on Earth will become easy. And that's what is driving our business model. Do the hard bit first and then uh, things will get easier on Earth. And how big is the market there? Uh, the space market is, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big market in the sense that if you quantify it in, uh, in numbers, the, the EU got together and they decided to put something in, the, in, in, in around 50 billion for the next two, three years for space projects. Yeah? So that's the amount that will be invested in space projects in the coming years. And of course, this is not available all for us, but, uh, but a part of it is, and bulk of it is for manufacturing components of satellites. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Well done, Siddharth. Martin can be a tough interviewer, so... Uh, oh, no problem. Very kind. <laughs> All right. We move on to our next presentation from Bird Shades, one that we got very excited about because I think we can all agree that we all love birds and don't want them to die anymore. So, <laughs> with that introduction, whenever you're ready, Dominique. Can, can you see my screen? Does I think it work? In a second? Yes, I can see it now. Okay, perfect. Just waiting for presentation mode. Okay. And do the slides move? Can you see that too? I can see the bird moving. Okay, but good. So I'm ready. <laughs> okay, let's go. Good. So glass is a must have in the modern building industry, but it is also an invisible and deadly trap for many birds. And we're building cities made out of glass directly into the sorry, We can't actually, I'm not sure if we can see it. Oh, sorry, oh. sorry, sorry to interrupt. We do, we do see the presentation. Do see? No? Okay. okay, so we're building cities made out of glass directly into the migrations of birds. 
And in the US alone, up to 1 billion birds die every year just because of collisions with glass. And this is not just a problem for entire bird species and the ecosystem, but also for property owners, which experience public pressure and legislation, which is more and more increasing. And the current solutions on the market are often not very attractive. So we've come up with a different solution. We develop a transparent window film, which is easy to apply on existing buildings and very effective for birds. Um, this is on the basis that birds see the UVA range of the visible light, which we humans don't. Um, so we've developed special inks in a very specific um, pattern, which we have in a multi-layer system, which makes our film noticeable to birds. Um, we've installed and sold our beta version of our film to pilot customers. So we're currently in the technology readiness level of five, and we've sold it to pilot customers such as the Austrian Railway and as a, to a high rise. Um, our potential customers are property owners such as private and state owned companies, which um, have the incentive to make their building birth proof, for example, because of environmental issues or legal issues. Um, it is still a very young and emerging market with the potential to grow. And our go to market strategy is to start with pilot customers and to later um, work together with distributors and licensing models. Our revenue models is um, a B2B direct sales approach to gain traction. We sell our film, which has a, the same price as um, visible films. And we also offer a package with an installation service where we cooperate with um, subcontractors. And in a later stage, we have distributors and licensing. Um, our timeline is that um, we upscale our product for market entry and to build up our sales and distribution channel. Um, this is our team. So I'm Dominique. I'm the founder of Birdshades. I have a background in animal behavior. And Christoph is our product development engineer. He has um, expertise in surface coachings and film. And Melanie is our very supportive assistant. We have a great advisory board. Um, with two of the world leading um, experts in bird window collisions, our investor and my friend Bettina, who founded Birdshades Initiative with me. Yeah, so we're currently fundraising and looking for collaboration partners. And yeah, it would be great if you join our team to make the, the sky a safer place for birds to fly. Thank you so much, Davini. Great, we'll take one question and I'm gonna pick Robert to ask you something this time. So you said, Dominique, that you were currently fundraising. Yeah. What are sort of sums of money are you using? Because I would guess that uh, material costs are going to be quite expensive. Um, we're raising 600K, but we can leverage it with grants up to 2 million euros. Right, and how much are the material costs? Um, it varies. So as long as it's lab scale, scale it's manageable, but we're using existing materials which we adapt so it's it's okay so okay just yeah thanks yeah. So I also have one question from uh, someone in the audience from Vamsi um, asking, is the film available and durable through its lifetime of usage? So I'm guessing, you know, how, how long does it last? Yeah, we're doing tests. So we have, um, except we test them in climate chambers um, and we soon have more results on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we're going to move now sort of back in time and remember that time when we couldn't share a screen and we couldn't present with uh, Alexei from Garnet. So we're going to give that a second try with Christina's help as well. A lot of teamwork. Let's see if everyone is ready for our last. Person. Ready. You're ready. Christina's sharing. I'll time it. And between the three of us, we'll have a great presentation. Let's start. Thank you for helping out. <laughs> So, shall we go? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexei, and I'm a co-founder of Garnet, a hardware company that develops uh, sensors for monitoring assets that are operated in harsh environments. We are uh, currently a team of five, incubated in the Isabik program in Graz, Austria. Next, please. 
the innovation that uh, our innovation actually addresses the cargo inspection market and in particular identification of cargo that contains dangerous or counterfeit goods and by cargo i mean truck train and uh, port inspection there have been several uh, eu level reports that state that uh, x-ray will continue to play the central role in addressing this issue next please uh, a typical X-ray cargo inspection system has a one major part, which is called the detection matrix. The detection matrix forms around 30% of the cost of the whole equipment. And uh, it starts with around 100 to 150 euros, 50,000 euros per piece. Next, please. Our innovation is the material which is used in this matrix. It is 40 times faster than any commercially available material for such detection matrices on the on the market and our end product the end goal is actually to develop and sell the detection matrix itself next please the value proposition is definitely the speed increase in cargo inspections so for trains in uh, in using our uh, uh, detection matrix we can increase the speed from current 15 to 20 kilometers per hour to actually screening the trains to 60 kilometers per hour next please there are several steps uh, to achieve this goal and uh, we have successfully achieved the first milestone which is actually commercially supplying the two crystals of our material to institute of nuclear physics in italy for a massive physics experiment next please and uh, next we will definitely develop the prototype of the detection matrix itself for which we have already secured the participation of the institute of nuclear physics in italy plus we are in the final stages of communication with CERN in geneva as well as the dominant player in the inspection market, which is Smith Detection. After that, we will uh, do the production facility. And for that, we are seeking uh, seven to eight million euro in funding and investment, for which we will definitely generate a turnover of at least three million in the first year. And our final goal is to actually become a monopoly in the detection matrix market, which is currently valued at one billion euros. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Alex, and thanks for being patient with the technical issues, which we knew we were going to have, it just happens. So now I'm going to ask Robert again if he has a question for you. How are you going to become a monopoly? Well, simply because uh, uh, it, it is a very, the, the barrier to enter this market is very high because there are only three key players on the market and Smith is uh, the global leader in this. 70% of uh, the inspection market is actually under Smith. So the barrier to enter is high, but uh, once you're in the market, well, basically you become a monopoly in this market. And we are sure we can do this because uh, we are already supplying Smith with uh, tiny crystals of our material for the small inspection systems, for the airport inspection, not for the big ones, the cargo inspection market, but for the small ones. And uh, they are the only company on the market that use our material. And with this material, they have been able to acquire 70, more than 70% of the share of the global market of airport inspection. So we basically try to repeat the same story with the cargo inspection. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay, guys, with that, we are actually done. We've gone through 13 presentations in almost the time that I expected. So that's good. I'm going to share my, my screen again really quickly. Um, okay. Hopefully you see this. Don't worry, I'm not sharing it for very long. Okay, we do have a few more questions in the live stream, but we're like five minutes behind what I was hoping uh, the time would be now. And because at least here in Berlin, it's a really nice evening. The lockdown has been eased. People might want to go for a walk or so. I don't know what the situation is where you are in the world, but we want to stick to our schedule. So I'm going to ask all the startups to have a quick look at the live stream in the next 20 minutes or so. They no longer have to pitch. You can relax now. If there's a question there for you, it would be nice if you, if you answered it. Um, and in the meantime, anyone else watching, if you want to keep writing any feedback, any comments, any questions for our startups, please do so. Now, what's going to happen next? So we're done with the startup pitches. So the jury is going to go using this fantastic Zoom technology in their own little private Zoom room where they will stay for the next 15, 20 minutes and decide, um, you know, talk a little bit about what they've seen and decide who should get um, our three prizes.
But again, I want to remind you, it's not about the prizes and hopefully everyone learned a lot um, this week and that's, that's the prize for everyone, all the learning, all the wisdom. And um, while the jury is doing that, we thought it would be fun and interesting to not let you look at a blank screen that says startup pitches, which is no longer the case. And uh, so we've asked a very recent Inam friend that we've, uh, that we've made recently from the US, uh, Dr. Zina, I'm not gonna try to pronounce her last name because I don't wanna kill it, to come and give us a quick 15 minute presentation on what she sees to be as the challenges and opportunities that startups in material science are facing now and are probably going to face for a while after this crisis. So I'm gonna hand over to her. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And she will probably share hers in a second. I hope she's here. Yes, she is. <laughs> Hi, Zina. Hey, Antonia, do you see my screen? I see that you started screen sharing, yes. And okay. I can see you as well. Perfect. Uh, you have 15 minutes to entertain and Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Antonio, and hello, everyone. I hope that you've had a great, successful week, and I also hope that no matter where you're tuning in from, that you are staying healthy and safe. My name is Zina Jarahi Sinker. I am currently the CEO and managing partner at the C6 Advanced Material Firm. So before I start, I wanted to just give you a little bit of flavor about who I am and a little bit of background about myself. By training, I'm a condensed matter physicist and a graphene specialist, and when I, oh, but I always have had this entrepreneurial spirit. So when I was doing my postdoc at Vanderbilt University, I started my first company in the graphene application development space. And that was a whole new experience for me because I started seeing all the challenges of taking a material and a technology from the lab into the marketplace. So I started seeing some of those components that comes into play when we are trying to uh, commercialize a new technology, like lack of international standards, navigating the environmental health and safety landscape. And through the work that I started doing, I was asked to run the Association for Graphene for North America. And I served as executive director of the National Graphene Association for three years. And I um, early this year, I resigned from our role to start a new platform, uh, the C6 Advanced Material Firm, which is a strategy and implementation firm uh, working on streamlining and architecting the advanced material ecosystem. So 10 years in this space, and I've done nothing but graphene and advanced materials, and I've seen the challenges of commercialization of, graph, uh, of, of advanced materials from many different angles. And one of the few things that I get asked these these days a lot is the question of um, it, what is going to be happening in the innovation space with the current crisis and I'm sure that that is also something that is on your mind as well. Um, people are getting asked uh, what does the future look like for companies in, in the innovation and advanced material space because we don't know what is going to be happening with the shift in funding. We don't know what is going to be happening with the strategic changes in many companies and the truth is that all of us know that economical downtimes uh, in many industries one of the first few things that get asked is marketing and innovation. We know that many of the companies in this space, they're going to be falling back on their legacy systems, the people who are, are end users, uh, uh, they're going to be um, falling back on the legacy offerings and as a result of that innovation and the funding for innovation is going to be taking a back seat. Yes, it does look grim and it is going, it's something we have to be prepared for. Um, but at the same time, um, we also have to remember that the the, this, this, this downturn in innovation is usually comes into play when that innovation is not quite aligned with solving the problem that caused a downfall from the first place. So this is actually going to be an opportunity for us. This, this crisis, this current crisis, maybe we can look at it as a silver lining, an opportunity for us because there's going to be immense amount of funding spent on ensuring that we recover from this and that we are not going to be in the same situation uh, for the next ones to come. So that is an opportunity. And on top of that, start thinking about it this way. Our world is changing. Because of this, this, this pandemic, because of COVID-19, our future is taking a different shape. 
And this, this shape is not just in the antiviral, let's say, virtual distancing, virtual working together, et cetera. It is much, much broader than that. We are seeing a change in human behavior. We're seeing a change in the policies, in the guidelines, in the infrastructure, building codes, um, uh, product development, product needs uh, that are going to be coming into play. We are seeing a whole new wave of needs and need for innovation that's coming to play. So, uh, and, and when we're going to talk about that, let's also focus on the fact that we're not just talking about PPE, we're not talking about just diagnosis, we're not talking about antiviral coatings. It is going to be, this need is going to be much, much, much broader than, uh, than the scope of just antiviral coatings or PPE uh, in, in this bit, mask in this space. It's going to be mostly focused on the needs of the post-pandemic world of tomorrow. And if, as startups, if, as advanced material community, we can identify and map out those technical and societal needs in the next 12 to 18 months, we can strategically align our efforts with this new wave of innovation that is going to be needed. And we'll not only be able to survive this, but we'll actually, actually be able to thrive in this environment. But it is not going to be easy. So let me give you an example. Um, a few months ago when it was the, the boom of this pandemic and we were seeing that a lot of companies coming to us and as it was unfolding, we started seeing that they were needing, um, need, they're having needs, for example, for identifying testing facilities, uh, scientific partners. And, and as that went on, we started realizing that, oh, wait, almost 70% of, of this space is actually working on one single product which is masks. Everybody in the advanced material community that we knew about in the material space, they were looking at how to implement their product or their material into a mask. Well, um, you don't need an MBA to look at this problem and say, okay, well, th that's, that's not right. And there's going to be a, there's going to be a problem with this. Uh, the space is so crowded and it is, um, it, it, it's not just the companies that were coming up with, with these ideas about how to make better masks. It was also our scientific institutions and scientific labs that are working on, on new avenues of, of innovation and collaboration that were still focused on just mass or a bit of them on diagnostics. And the other thing is that the path to commercialization, health and safety evaluations for a product that contains nanomaterials, such as graphene, for example, in my own space, graphene nano playlists, it is going to be so long that it is most likely not going to make it in a mass production and to respond to the need of the acceleration phase of this pandemic. And more important than that, and this is, this, is, this is extremely important in this sense that when we actually go and talk to doctors, nurses and clinicians, so we went to them and say, you know what, we're making better masks for you guys. It's going, to be, uh, it's going to be antiviral, it's going to be better filtering, this and that. They told us, guys, we don't need better masks. We had great masks before. The problem you're seeing in the media reflect is because we don't have masks, period. If you could provide us with masks, that would be fantastic. But if you're talking about innovation for a new, new, new wave of masks, that's not what we need right now. But while we're at it, the problem we're having is that our goggles are fogging. We can't see through it. Can you come up with a solution for our goggle fogging? And we said, you know what? Actually, we can. Then we realize that there is this immense and extreme need for us to identify opportunities that are not coming from us as innovation providers, but it's coming from us, from, from us seeking out the advice and, and uh, the, the projections coming from the innovation seekers and innovation consumers. And it is important for us to identify what are really the opportunities in the next few years and that we do not respond to this from, uh, from technology sitting around and thinking, how can we implement our material in a solution that we thought was a solution? So it, it, for us to be able to look at this, this map of needs and to, to develop a roadmap to allow, uh, to allow us to look at the underserved areas, as well as the, those opportunities in the next few years, it is a tall order. It's going to be requiring a lot of innovation. It's going to be luck, requiring a lot of information, insight, and coordination. 
So we've been seeing this absolute need on the global scale for an entity, for an organization to come in and develop those resources and develop that roadmap for the good of our advanced material community and uh, to understand what can we do here to help. So introducing the Advanced Material Pandemic Task Force. So what is the Pandemic Task Force? The Pandemic Task Force is a global networking, global group that is coming together to use advances in material science for not only the prevention and management of global health crisis, but for addressing the technological and societal needs that is going to be coming up in the next few years and in the post-pandemic world. The goal for us to be able to create a group that will be crossing boundaries and borders and for all of us coming together, sharing our information, sharing our knowledge, sharing our resources, sitting at one table and looking at how our materials, how our technologies can help in the betterment of the human life and humanity as a whole. So the task force is going to be establishing a framework to set strategies and also coordinate some of these higher level global activities in the pandemic and post pandemic era. And they're going to do this through three different verticals that I will spend a little bit more time talking about through developing a library of knowledge through developing an extensive mapping of user centric needs for the pandemic and post pandemic uh, intervals, and also to create an expansive network of scientific labs, advanced material companies, um, testing facilities, material providers, and anybody who has actually a resource and, and, and expertise that can come to the table and we can activate. And all of that for us to be able to put together a roadmap that tells us how can we use advanced materials to become solutions and how can those solutions be deployed for the different phases of a pandemic such as COVID-19. So one of the verticals that I talked about in this is we need to know what do we really know about our material in this space, what is being done right now from what is published to what is being done in, in, in collaborative space in different uh, labs in the, in, in the global scale and also for us to understand what are the products on the market right now that are enabled through advanced material technologies that are meant to address uh, management and prevention of pandemics. The other component and vertical in, the, uh, in this space is the extensive network that we'll be developing of resources and organization and capabilities uh, that would allow us to, to mobilize our resources when they are needed to be able to address those, uh, those needs of that we will be identifying. And what are those needs that we'll have to be identifying? We are going to be to get putting together, and this is one of the most important part of this initiative that we started, is to understand a map of needs to develop a heat map for innovation needs of, again, technological and societal needs, not in just right now and not in just the first few months of a pandemic, but for the long run. And to be able to, um, to go to our innovation seekers uh, to, to put together this, this map of needs. And also to do that, we have to understand that there are different intervals in a pandemic. And for us to get a real sense of what we're dealing with, we have to look at um, the fact that in the CDC intervals of the pandemic, we're looking at an acceleration phase, which has a characteristic of lack of supplies, scarcity of supplies, and a chaos. And it usually lasts about two or three months. And we're kind of coming out of that. But what is interesting is that most of the innovation um, activity in our advanced mature community is focused on addressing the needs of those two or three months. Forgetting that we have a long way in front of us, 12 to eight months, 18 months and past that, 
for the preparation for the next pandemic phase that is going to be requiring a lot more innovation in the sense of what is going to be happening in the future of our workplace, um, our, our, our retail, our shopping, our air travel, tourism, manufacturing. Let me give you an example. So we started talking to retailers and we started asking them, um, should we provide antiviral coatings for you guys? And they said, you know what, that would be fantastic. But what we need right now and we're seeing it breaking down is that our points of sale system where you swipe your credit cards, those systems are failing because we're cleaning them so much with alcohol. We have 400% more transactional fails. Can you do something with that? We don't want antiviral coatings right now. Can you guys put, create a protective coating that allows us to protect these, these systems already in place by the time that these will be replaced because these systems have to have some sort of innovation incorporated. We're not going to be stopping cleaning stuff with alcohol. And that is going to come to end into play. We're not going to be stopping in the next um, two to three years being worried about distancing, social distancing. It's still going to be in place no matter how this, this, this pandemic and that's how this crisis fares. So we have to start thinking about this. We have to look at air travel. Airlines are actually considering individual pods right now. And if that, is, if that is in place, and if that's something that they're going to go towards, we have to be ready for it. Maybe our technology, maybe our innovation could be a part of what is about to come. So expand when you're thinking about this, expand your horizons in terms of it's not just PP, it's not just diagnostic. Maybe my solution, maybe our material can actually be a part of something that is going to be needed and a market that is going to be uh, opened um, in, the, in the very near future. Uh, for, for addressing these uh, challenges. So as for the pandemic task force, with these three different verticals in place for the library of knowledge, map of needs, and the network, uh, we're going to be gathering the knowledge that is needed for us to be able to get a vision and overview of landscape and come up with a strategic roadmap in understanding what are the advanced material solutions in this space and how can they be deployed and how can they be facilitated and fast tracked at, time, at different phases of the pandemics. And we are doing this, 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 this um, pandemic task was a philanthropic mission. It truly came out of a need because we thought that um, we cannot just sit back as a, some of the leaders in this field. We thought that there, there is a def, def, definite need for us to be able to provide resources for companies, no matter what stage of development they're in, for them to be able to thrive and not go out of business and, and not be stunted in their development, but to be able to be integrated and look at the solutions and for us to be able to facilitate those solutions for them. And we're going to be here as a resource. We're going to be here with you. We're all going through this together. Uh, so it is our responsibility in this sense to help. So I want to end this on a positive note. I think that this is actually a silver lining for a lot of us in, in the advanced material community, especially in my field of graphene. A lot of times when we go to people and we try to talk about the innovation uh, that this, our materials, our technologies can bring, we get told, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The silver lining is that it is broke now. Can we fix it? And while we're fixing it, can we evaluate if our materials and our technologies are going to be uh, able to provide a solution? an effective solution to the problems that we're having right now. So this is a prime time for innovation, that the future might look a little bit grim, but let's look at it and say, uh, how can we help and how can we uh, leverage that uh, to thrive in this space and help our own companies? So with that, I'm going to end and uh, you can, um, we are going to be um, opening a round of applications for, uh, for folks to join the network of, of the Advanced Material Pandemic Task Force that is going to be opening up probably in about 10 days. Uh, everybody's welcome to join and I'm always available. You can find me on LinkedIn. Any questions, anything that we can do to help, we're going to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zina. Thank you for that. And that's a very positive note to end on. Um, and we do hope that Perhaps even some of the ideas presented today can be part of the solution to, to what we're all currently facing. So next up, so just so you know what's happening, our jury is still debating. Uh, we give them a few more minutes, but in the meantime, I'd like to ask Ferdinand, if he's still with us on the call, and I think he is, to um, say a few words on behalf of the board of ENA. 
Yeah, I, I hope you can hear me reasonably well. Put my glasses off. Uh, so, um, well, Antonia, you put me in a tight spot uh, to have some minutes to talk after all these uh, 13 great pitches and uh, after Rosina giving her presentation, it's uh, going to be very difficult for me to tell you anything that's of any interest. Uh, so on this YouTube channel, please don't run away after me is something else coming, maybe more interesting. Um, anyway, um, I already mentioned Enam is a network uh, for advanced materials, companies, research institutes, uh, startups that all share the common uh, ideas that uh, advanced materials play a very, very important role in all our futures. Uh, despite pandemics or whatever other great uh, difficulties might come up. Uh, but what I want to talk about now for a few minutes is more about accelerator programs. Uh, I've uh, thought about it while I listened to all the speeches. Um, uh, Admacom is an accelerator program. And uh, what is the purpose of an accelerator program? Well, Admacom, of course, is the best accelerator program that there is in the world. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but there are a few things that all accelerator programs share, share, and that's they try to accelerate something, um, which makes sense. It's kind of in the name. So what they typically try to accelerate is they try to accelerate uh, innovative ideas to success and to failure. The important part is both directions. Uh, an accelerator program should be indifferent uh, to success and failure, the only thing it should care about, it should just accelerate things uh, because that's good for all sides. It's good for you, it's good for, for us, it's good for the industry. If something doesn't work, it's good to attend to something else. Uh, why is an accelerator program good for many startups? Uh, for most startups, um, accelerator programs are, in my opinion, an excellent way to bring your ideas first to a greater audience, typically to a very friendly audience. Um, you might have the feeling that some of the mentors were not that friendly, but generally it's, it's, a, it's a very friendly audience. Uh, you have a chance to present your ideas, your business plans, your strategies, uh, your product, uh, find a way in a, in a friendly atmosphere, find a way where the people do actually understand it, what you present to them or do not understand it. And you learn the lessons that if they don't understand it, it's your fault. Uh, you have to do a better job in explaining it because as you go out there, uh, later there will be more people that don't understand it. And if you can't explain what your innovation is all about, then you have a problem to begin with. Uh, another benefit is that you can fine tune your presentations, you have some visibility, you get some marketing, um, sometimes you even change your strategy, your visions, your business plans, because you talked to a few mentors and, and thought that their input was valuable. Uh, and you incorporate that in your, in your business plan and all in all, uh, I hope that uh, particular this acceleration program has uh, had a benefit for uh, your business potentials uh, and for your future. However, one thing I want to give you at this point, uh, most of you are relatively early in your startup career. Accelerators are a, a, a very, very important element in building a business, in learning how it works, but they're also kind of a dangerous drug. Uh, accelerator programs are not the real world. Uh, the real world are customers, investors, suppliers, um, maybe even legal and governments uh, if you're in the field of uh, legislation that you need. Uh, so don't mistake an accelerator program for, don't mistake success. Maybe you win later, maybe you don't, but don't mis make a mistake to think that an accelerator program, whether you win there, whether you participate as such is a success. It's, it's not, it's what you make out of it after the program. Uh, you had a chance to talk in this program to a number of mentors, uh, I think double digits for most of you or all of you. You had a chance, uh, you've seen there were about 80 or 90 people on the YouTube channel and another 20 here in this round. So you had a chance to talk to a lot of people and 
I believe quite a few of them told you, I find what you are doing interesting and I have some questions uh, and if you can answer me the questions then I would like to help you. Now it's on you after the accelerator program, after the ATMA come to make something out of it. Most of the people listening to you have a tight schedule. Uh, they, they listen to you for a few minutes. They have a tight, short attention span, if I might say. Um, they are potential customers, potential investors, potential consultants, potential suppliers. What do I know? Chase them afterwards. Stay in contact with them. Uh, push them. Uh, if you are not sure about uh, what they were talking about, go for the ones who were the most critical first. Because if you convince them, it's going to be much easier to convince the other ones. Uh, don't let them hide after the program here and not uh, providing the services that they promised you to provide. Uh, because after the accelerator programs, after this one, and, and I think some of you will make uh, a few more, but attending accelerator programs will not be your uh, uh, day filling exercise forever. Uh, it's going to be a training for you to find customers. It's going to be a training for you to sell your products to the market or maybe sell shares of your company to an investor. But definitely at the end of the day, you want to sell your product to a customer. And that's all what matters. Uh, the accelerator program isn't worth anything if it doesn't help you to sell your product uh, after the program. So that's, that's the only point uh, I wanted to make. Uh, I'm extremely happy and proud to have that you attended this program. And I'm, I, I think you all are very, very wonderful people and very, very wonderful businesses that you represent. Go after the customers at the, after the accelerator program, try to sell your product and fight hard for us. And I wish you the, all the success that I can hope for and push the mentors that have promised to help you, push the people that have com made comments to you and try to make something out of this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Ferdinand. So main takeaway, just chase people. Like if, if you need something from them, <laughs> chase them and they will for sure. Yeah, be, a, be a pain, be a pain. I mean, this is, uh, talk to people that are really salespeople, uh, people that make a living out of selling something. Uh, they know how it is uh, to, because most products don't sell alone. Most products are a hard job of selling. Uh, and it's you getting on some people's nerves. Just do it. It's worth yeah. it. And I think we, we've seen that with a lot of our previous Admacom startups as well. They Some of them have really good technology, but they needed to get more salesy and more extroverted and to actually go and chase people. So that's definitely really good advice. Okay, thank you all for staying with us. We're so long. It's 5.15. Uh, it's really sunny here. So we won't keep you for a lot longer. The jury has debated and debated, and they've come to a conclusion. And so we have three prizes, which I announced in the beginning, and I'd like to tell you who gets them. In addition to that, the jury really wanted to recognize what they thought to be the best pitches of today. So even though I couldn't come up with any spontaneous prizes on the spot, I would still like to mention which one were the, the three sort of top pitches in the honest opinion of the jury. I'll start off with the prizes first. So one of our prizes was a three month uh, professional membership in Motion Lab Berlin. So that prize goes to the guys from Project Ceramic. So well done to them. Usually at this stage, people clap. We can't really clap, but we're like virtually all clapping. Okay. Our other prize, our second prize, but was not second, just another prize, um, was a um, free consultation session regarding IP strategy with uh, Robert, who you also met some of you during your mentoring sessions, who's also on the jury from 24 Law IP Group. Um, and that goes to Coltech. Well done, Cole. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> and then our third prize um, was is offered by Contitech, specifically by um, Katya. Again, some of you might have met her in the mentoring sessions. And that will be a workshop on how to better market your technology, so marketing and business development workshop. And that goes to AC Biot. Okay. And last but not least, I want to recognize the top three pitches. So the third one. Uh, according to the jury, was from Dominique from Bird Shades. Well done, Dominique. The second one was from the guys at Project Ceramic. 
And the best pitch, in the opinion of the jury, but maybe also some of, some of you think that, was from Blacktop Labs. So well done, Tanya and Hobi. I think we were all also very impressed with your team photo. I've never seen such an impressive team photo like ever in my life. So that was very cool. Okay, this is very strange because I don't hear you like talking and clapping. So does anybody want to add anything, any comments, any thoughts, wishes? Anyone from the jury, anyone from the startups? Yeah, what I can say from the jury is uh, I have heard most of your pitches twice once on Tuesday and once now on Friday. And I must say, I am seriously impressed. Um, first of all, at the beginning already, how many good pitches there were, but now how massively all you have, all you have, all you have improved in your pitches. It's, it's a huge improvement. You really took your feedback uh, and one really sees the effort that you've put in. So very, very well done and congratulations. Thank you so much. And we're really happy to see that too. There's definitely some, I don't know if progress necessarily, but some change from the first time we saw your pitches to now. Um, so we're, we're very happy to see that. I don't wanna keep people a lot longer, but I do wanna ask if anyone wants to say or add anything at all to everything that has been said. We're getting a lot of comments on the live stream. Everyone's saying congratulations and good job. And I totally agree. I think you guys have done really well. This was a very intense program and it is quite hard to stay tuned for a week, especially in an online setup. So we really appreciate it. And we're very happy you could join us. And we will extend some invitations to all of you guys and the, and the startups to become members of Enum. And we hope you'll, you'll accept that. So we'll definitely keep in touch. That being said, I will wrap things up. This has been a lot of fun. I hope that next time we do this, we can all be somewhere together in, uh, in Berlin. Thank you all so much for joining. Thanks also for everyone who joined on the live stream. And especially big thanks to our startups. You've all done so well. And we'll see you soon.